call to worship is from Psalm 145. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend God's work to another. They will tell of his mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of his majesty, and we will meditate on God's wonderful works. They will tell of the power of his awesome works, and we will proclaim his great deeds. They will celebrate God's abundant goodness and joyfully sing of his righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. Please stand for hymn number 531. standing and turn to page 31 for the Liturgy of Grace. There are a few places where it calls for parts to be sung in, in this liturgy, but we will sing all the parts together. We worship you, Lord God, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You dwell in the high and holy place and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit. the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. God spoke these words, saying, You shall have no other God beside me. You shall not
Lord Jesus Christ said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. <laughs> Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the unrepentant. Incline your ear and hear, for we do not present our supplications before you on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercies. <coughs> Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain in us a willing spirit. Have mercy upon us according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thus says the Lord, I will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. Peace be with you. Please stand. <laughs> join in professing our faith with the whole of
Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time to make our common intercession to you. And you have promised through your beloved Son that where two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill, fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Anybody in the room? Oh. Yeah, okay. okay, good morning. Good to see you all. So today at noon, we're leaving for Urban Immersion, and uh, several of those who are going are here, actually. So we got Kylie and Taylor and Ari and Gina and Brooklyn, and Logan, and a couple others who aren't here. So they're all together, I think I have a list here. All together there are 11 people. So there's eight students, Brooklyn, Logan, the three Newtons, Alan Retzloff, Drew Starr, Maggie Stevens, Maggie's gonna meet us in route, by the way, and Terry and Ari Van Leeshout. So that's, that's the whole crew that's gonna go. Uh, Terry, you should be up here. You need to come up and join us. <laughs> so Urban Immersion, what it is, is uh, about 20 years ago, the Minneapolis Council of Churches put together uh, an operation and actually built a building in one of the worst neighborhoods in Minneapolis to, uh, to have a place where people could go to serve in the poorer areas of Minneapolis and things like that shelters and food distribution centers, and also where there could be a safe dormitory uh, classroom type operation. So what these young people are going to be doing is in the evening they're going to have classes about learning about urban problems and about the urban poor, and then during the daytime they're going to go out to various places and serve, uh, help with distributing food, help with sorting clothing, various things. One year we even painted somebody's garage. That's not on the list this year, by the way. That, that was the all-time disaster. So we take, uh, so we usually take seventh and eighth graders, and that's kind of their first step into our mission program. And then they'll go, when they're in high school, they'll go to New York, and then uh, later on in high school to Jamaica, College students end up going all over the place to Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Honduras, and our adults, of course, have gone off to various places, including our water projects and the hospital project in Honduras. So this is kind of like opening the door. This is, this is the beginning. And a couple of you went last year, so you sort of know what to expect again. But uh, I hope you all have a good time and uh, uh, learn a lot while you're there. So let's have a prayer for our missionaries. Gracious Lord, we ask that you bless these young people and their chaperones as they travel to Minneapolis. We ask that you grant them safe travel, that you help them as they serve others to see you in the, in the face of all people. 
and to learn about communities that they're not familiar with, urban, uh, sometimes downtown, poorer communities, uh, to learn about the homeless and those who struggle to, uh, to live and to survive in our cities. We also would ask that you help them to learn from the instructors and the teachers who will talk to them in the evenings, that you will grant them open hearts and open minds so that they can gain wisdom that they will be able to take with them for the rest of their lives as they continue to be in your service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Of course, a lot of what we do depends on, uh, on what you do and how you open your, your hearts and your pocketbooks to support the church. The mission work actually tends to support itself, which is kind of an amazing thing to me. Uh, but all the other you know, administrative things and, uh, and getting things organized and all the work that is done to make these trips possible and to make this work that we do for Jesus possible all comes from you. So we would ask that you, you help us each and every Sunday but particularly on this Sunday that you pray for our missionaries and that you keep them in mind as we worship our Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Would our usher service, please? <laughs> Gracious Lord, we bring you these humble gifts of thanksgiving for the many blessings that you have 
bestowed upon us. We ask that you help us to use them wisely so that we can do your will and represent you in our world. We're holding in our prayers this morning Cheryl Hunt, who is in the hospital, Armin Tipler, who is awaiting uh, biopsy results, and we know this can be a difficult time, so we ask that you bring him peace. Our hearts are with Jim Sarkis and Linda Albert, who continue to battle cancer, and to all others who are ill and who are fighting disease or persecution or poverty. We ask that you bring peace to all your people. We wish our best for Marla Sternard and Jeff Lestilla, now Marla and Jeff Lestilla, who were married yesterday. We ask your blessing upon them as they begin this new phase of their life. And we also would ask a special blessing for little Grayson, who was born on July 29th, and on Nick and Amy, his parents, that they may raise him as you would have them, and that he would lead a holy, healthy, and peaceful life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. And eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, 
I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Our second reading comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. We are working the Newton family overtime today. We have uh, Gina in the nursery. Tim was down at the elevator entrance ushering down there. He's doing the reading. The two older girls are going on a mission trip this afternoon. I think the only thing left for them to do is to do the sermon. Uh, <laughs> Tim says no. I, well, I'll give it a stab then. There's a movie that uh, stars Steve Martin and Deborah Winger called Leap of Faith. Um, I'd argue that that's the best of Steve Martin's many films, although admittedly that's not saying a whole lot. But Leap of Faith is not a comedy. It's essentially a remake of the old movie called Elmer Gantry, which starred Burt Lancaster. There's a name from the past. And it, that film was inspired by the actual life of the evangelist Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday is a topic that we might take several Sundays no pun intended, to cover. So we won't go there, but I, let's talk a little bit about the movie Leap of Faith. Has anybody seen it? One, two, couple, three, just a few. Okay. In that movie, Steve Martin plays a traveling evangelist who pulls into a town and sets up a tent, and then he and his troop entertain, they preach repentance, and most importantly, they perform miracles of healing and such things. Now it's all fake. It's all very closely controlled by the character that Martin plays. And the people he cures are either hired ahead of time to be cured, or else they are people who have psychological problems and he sh gives them a short-term brainwashing and they get better. His caravan, as he's going to the next town, breaks down in this small backwater western town. And they have to wait several days to get their big truck repaired. So deciding to make the most of it, he sets up the tent and starts a show, or a revival meeting, if you prefer. The town is in the midst of a severe drought. <coughs> and after seeing the miracles that he performs every night, the people begin to ask him to pray for and bring about the miracle of rain in order to save their farms and, and save their town. So in order to draw more people and get more money than this little town had to offer from outside of the town, outside the area, he fakes a miracle. He makes a statue of the Madonna spontaneously cry. Word gets out and the town is suddenly full to overflowing with pilgrims who have come to see the miracle. Through all this, the town sheriff figures the whole thing for a scam and he tries his best to shut it all down. Martin himself falls for a local girl who's, there's always a love interest, right, whose brother is unable to walk due to an accident. And the younger brother, the one who can't walk, wants to go to the revival to be healed. 
Martin, knowing that it's all fake, tries to discourage him because he doesn't want to ruin his relationship with his sister. But the young lad shows up one night anyway. And rather than admit that it is all a hoax, Martin says his mumbo jumbo over the boy. And miracle of miracles, the boy throws away his crutches and he walks. Not real well, pretty tentatively at first to be sure, but he does walk. And Martin is dumbfounded. The sheriff doesn't know quite what to do, because he knows that one's not fake. And the girlfriend, of course, is overjoyed. Martin is jolted right down to the depths of his soul. He doesn't know what he should do, but finally he decides to quit his life of deceit and theft. And leaving it all behind, he goes out on the highway to hitchhike away and leave it all behind and go off to a new and honest life. He gets a ride in a big truck, and as it starts to drive away, it begins to rain. And the last scene in the movie is of this dishonest preacher hanging out the window of the truck in the pouring rain, hollering out, Thank you, Jesus. The movie is about, among other things, Jesus' ability, God's willingness to find the good. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a finite amount of good to hand out that she must portion out somehow to only those who are good, honest, and deserving. She has an abundance of spiritual strength. The Spirit of God sees our failure as opportunity. Where we see scarcity, she sees abundance. And that is what I most especially like about this well-known story that we, Tim just read for us about the loaves and fishes. I think Tim said it's the third time he's read it since he started reading for it. Generally, we look at this story as a miracle performed by Jesus. Even if we understand it as a metaphor, we think of it as an explanation that Jesus has room for all of us and enough blessing for all of us. Where there appears to be little, Jesus can make enough. <coughs> and certainly all that is true. If you have faith in Jesus, you will be blessed. There is or are enough loaves and fishes for all of us. We also sometimes see the story as an explanation that even in times of scarcity and want, we need to understand that God has created enough food, enough space, and enough shelter for everyone. And we need to share our five loaves and two fishes, even if we think there's not enough and we really desire to hoard it for our own use. It's a good lesson. <coughs> you know, we teach our little children to share, but sometimes as we grow up, we forget that lesson. <coughs> Still, what I truly fixate on when I read this story is the idea of abundance that we find in verse 20. The disciples, after the feeding of the 5,000, and then some actually, go out and pick up leftovers, and they end up with more than what they started with. Sometimes in the church we act as though great sacrifices are needed to help others. We have to give until it hurts. We have to endure hardship in foreign places in order to do mission work. We make saints and heroes <coughs> out of monks and martyrs. Certainly there is a place for these things in God's plan, and we should recognize those heroes of the faith. But the fact remains that we do not have to suffer in order to be good Christians. There is an abundance. There's an abundance of spiritual food and an abundance of material things so that all can be satisfied. We, <coughs> we just need to have faith that this is true. Tim, maybe I should have let you do this. Just for those of you who are wondering, I don't have a cold. It's, I've been struggling with allergies here in Door County. Unfortunately, despite this story and, and many others like it, we fail to trust that God will provide. A few years ago on one of our urban immersion trips to Minneapolis, our young people worked at a food distribution center. And they remarked later that the food was not very good. The corn was moldy, the veggies were rotten, Mostly what they did was sort out the edible from the inedible food. The leader explained that that was because this was leftover food that grocery stores donated because they could not sell it. 
We happily give our leftovers to those in need. But I think at its center, the reason we do so and give leftovers is because we are fearful that there is not enough good stuff for everyone. We do not trust God or the bounty that we find in his creation. Modern man hoards money, food, and other stuff as though there is not enough for everyone to have. Jesus did not tell his disciples to feed themselves and then hand out the leftovers to the crowd. Give them what you have, he said, and there will be enough for all. And there was. I think we tend to do the same thing with our faith. There are only so many people that God will save, and we want to be first among that group. We see a choice between church and harvest. <coughs> and so we feed our souls first and feed others what is left. Thankfully, where we see scarcity, there is actually abundance. There is enough food for everyone. There's enough salvation for everyone. Our failures are Jesus' opportunities. Now, that movie, Leap of Faith, is fiction, of course, but it contains great truth. God can use the weakest of us to do miracles. God has enough faith, love, and strength for all of us. He isn't going to run out. We don't need to starve ourselves in order to feed others. <coughs> we don't need to somehow deny ourselves the pleasures of God's creation in order to be faithful or spiritual or to be Jesus' disciples. The only thing we need to deny is our lack of faith. The various missions that we do as a congregation, such as Loaves and Fishes, Urban Immersion, our New York and Jamaica service trips, Honduras projects, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and so on, should teach us that we have an awful lot to give. We're not going broke because we do these missions, and we are not spiritually depleted when we do these things. In fact, we are spiritually renewed, and our mission funds actually miraculously seem to grow from year to year. So, as I said, at noon today, I'll be going with nine youth and two other adults for our annual urban immersion trip. It's my prayer that the one big thing they will take away from this experience is that God has given them an abundance of love and spiritual strength, which they can share. When the trip is over, I'm sure that they will find that they have more, not less. We all are called to serve God from the spirit of abundance rather than fear of scarcity. Amen. Please stand for hymn number 618. <coughs>
find the joy that comes through Jesus Christ. Go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Amen.